So the question is, um, what's the order of stability of these radicals? The order of stability of radicals one, two, and three. Two, three, one. Is two the most stable or the least? The most stable. Is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? Tertiary. Yeah, and then secondary and primary. Good. Why does substitution stabilize radicals? Because radicals are electron poor and carbon chains are electron donated. Good. How about question three? Three on planar. Yeah, so the question was what is the geometry of the central carbon of a tert butyl radical? the geometry of the central carbon of a tert butyl radical. But we don't even have to bother drawing what the tert butyl radical looks like, because we've just learned that the geometry of a radical is trigonal plane. I actually got that one right, too. I don't know why I said that. Huh? Great. <laughs> OK, so let's go on to some other radical reactions. we got the basic idea. So previously, we were seeing what happened when you tried to halogenate plain vanilla alkanes. But now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when you start with alkenes instead. Well, we can already guess what's going to happen in the first step here. What would be a likely first step based on our previous pattern? Um, we're going to break the bromine into two radicals. Yeah, so let's show that step. Name of that step? Um, initiation. Right. Now, actually, the convention is that we just pull the bromine out separately to show how it's going to react. The butene isn't reacting in the first step, so we're not going to pay much attention to it yet. Now, we're going to have to modify this step in a few minutes. This turns out not to be exactly what happened with alkenes, but this will be a good start. Now, what's an atom that we know is going to participate in the next step? The alkene? Or the carbon on the alkene? Yeah, and who else is going to participate? One of the radicals? Yeah, we know that, especially wanted to point out the radicals have to participate because they're unhappy. steal a hydrogen. Now it's not going to steal a hydrogen from the alkene. It's going to steal a hydrogen from the alkane carbon just like before. Okay. The question is, and notice I'm using bromine, which is highly selective. I'm using bromine, which is highly selective. Who would the bromine prefer to take the hydrogen from? This carbon or this carbon? The first one. That's right. That is true. Um, it's going to prefer to take it from this one. And the mechanism is going to be exactly the same as before. Mm -hmm. So um, let's show the mechanism for the bromine taking that hydrogen. You know we're forming a bond. Yep, so, so this is 
how we show a bond. I think he might have been worried that this also, we know that the arrows show which way the electron is moving, not which way the hydrogen is moving. However, in this particular case, the hydrogen happens to be accompanying the electron, so the arrow happens to be the direction for both of them. That wouldn't be true if this was a proton. Now, how did you know that the bromine is going to prefer to take the hydrogen? Yeah. Okay, you were right that the bromine would prefer to take this hydrogen. Because it's selected. Selecting the secondary. Yeah. Good. I didn't set up the problem not very intelligently. Let's put on another carbon here. Now, again, the bromine is not going to take the hydrogen from the alkene. Mm -hmm. It's going to take it from the alkane. But now we have three alkane carbons it could take from. Now these two are both secondary. Nevertheless, the bromine is going to prefer to take this secondary one, not this secondary one. Uh, obviously, both of those are better than the primary. Because it's adjacent to the double bond? That is right. But how does the double bond help? Why is it better to, to take the hydrogen from where we're adjacent to the double bond? Because it's more stable. Why? What could the double bond do to stabilize that unpaired electron? We're going to have to bring in a, a new thing that we haven't talked about really together. I'm sorry. Donate one of its electrons? Yeah, that's right. What, what, what's the name of how it's going to donate an electron? So it can donate an electron over here by resonance. Mm -hmm. right. So that's an issue that we haven't used in all the sessions that we've had so far. We haven't done anything with resonance yet. Mm -hmm. But resonance is an extremely powerful way to stabilize unhappy atoms. Uh, so, um, uh, that's uh, way too bad because most students are really bad at drawing resonance structures, but it's very important to be able to do the resonance here. So, um, how would we draw the other resonance structure here? I want to save time and I'll just show you. You can take one of the electrons out of this pi bond and use it to form a bond over here. But then we have to remember that this electron can't be left stranded in the bond, it has to go over to here. So now let's draw the other resonance structure that we would get based on those arrows. We're forming a new bond here. Very important to remember this arrow because that shows where the unpaired electron is going. Now, this is resonance, it's not a reaction. It's resonance, not a reaction. How do we know it's resonance and not a reaction? Because all we're doing is moving pi electrons around inside a single molecule. If you're just moving pi electrons around inside a single molecule, that's resonance. So you mentioned that your instructor asked you to learn all the different types of arrows. What type of arrow would we use to connect these two resonance structures? That's right, the double-headed arrow. So I would use a double-headed arrow to show this is not a reaction, this is resonance. These are two pictures of the same molecule, two ways of looking at the same thing. Now, we can see how resonance stabilizes this unpaired electron. It's like a hot potato. It's easier to carry a hot potato if it can be in more than one hand. Well, here we have sometimes the hot potato is here and sometimes it's here. Actually, that's not a great analogy because the, uh, we're not really moving between these two pictures. Resonance is not about moving, it's about the real molecule is a blend of these two. Well, that means that the real molecule has, in a sense, half of an unpaired electron over here and half of an unpaired electron over here. Well, that's better than trying to cram the whole unpaired electron into just one place. You want to spread out the problem as much as you can. So resonance lets us spread out the problem. All right, so that's the big new issue when you're halogenating um, with a double bond. You prefer, this is what's called the allylic carbon. Is that a term that your instructor has used? That doesn't sound, seem, look like that too, sounds too familiar to you. This is called the allylic carbon. The allylic yes. carbon is one that's connected to an alkene carbon. Okay. This is an alkene carbon. If you're connected to an alkene carbon, you're allylic. He's mentioned it in, when he's talking about stability. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that was the key issue we were talking about here. 
Resonance is very powerful. In fact, it usually is more important than substitution. So now what we would most like to do is form an allylic radical. That's more important than forming the most substituted radical, is to form the allylic radical in most cases. So um, in this type of problem, you're going to want to focus on the allylic radical. And in fact, bromine is so selective that um, we're not even going to worry about attacking these two carbons. These are really not going to be possible products here. Bromine is going to prefer to just attack the allylic carbon. This uh, was propagation step one. <laughs>